So I think we've started. So Matt, um, I'm going to introduce myself to everyone and anyone who is uh, listening. Um, my name is Kate Newbold. Oh, so um, welcome everybody. Uh, it is a great honor that I've been invited to um, have uh, an opportunity to chat to you through this uh, virtual conference. Uh, and I'm um, very grateful for the opportunity. Um, my name is Kate Newbold and I'm a clinical oncologist in the UK, uh, based in London. Um, and my specialties are head and neck cancer and thyroid cancer. And a clinical oncologist in the UK uh, means that we uh, are um, we practice in radiotherapy as well as systemic therapies as well, by which I mean drug therapies. So from the thyroid cancer point of view, uh, many of thyroid cancers are um, managed uh, under clinical oncology. Um, and so we tend to pick up patients after they've had their surgery. Uh, we will give them the radioactive iodine when required. We can give external beam radiotherapy, and then we also are able to prescribe the drug therapies. So um, we look after our patients really from this after the surgeons hand them over to us really uh, for, for as long as they remain on follow up. Um, and that gives us quite a unique overview of the management of um, uh, thyroid cancer uh, uh, in the UK. So what I'm um, have been given the title to talk about today is systemic therapies uh, for thyroid cancer and looking through the fantastic program for the next few days, you will also have um, very specific talks on systemic therapies or drug therapies for particular situations so for medullary thyroid cancer for iodine refractory thyroid cancer, uh, for anaplastic and the I really encourage you to attend those or tune into those because the speakers are experts and they are the, uh, the uh, teams that have actually provided the evidence. And so you've got a fantastic line up ahead. Um, so what I thought I'd do is just give a bit of background um, so that you can then fill in the details with those talks later on. So they were not completely um, doubling up on everything. Um, I... Um, uh, I'm encouraging you to type in your questions and uh, Matt is going to, to uh, let me know when questions come in. And rather than me just talking for the next hour, I hope that we can have some sort of dialogue, although clearly um, that's, uh, it's not um, completely straightforward when it's uh, electronic, but let's hope that's what we can do. So just um, moving onto the first slide. I just want to go through some terminology as well. And forgive me for those of you who this is all very familiar to, but it, it's quite a lot of the questions which uh, come up with my patients in consultation. So I just want to make sure that we all know um, exactly what, uh, what we're talking about when I'm referring to things. So differentiated thyroid cancer is, is an umbrella term which includes papillary, follicular and hurtle cell carcinoma. So when we talk about DTC, those are the subtypes that we're, we're talking about. Then we've obviously got medullary thyroid cancer, which can be familial within the multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes, the MEN syndromes, uh, or it can be sporadic, so with no hereditary pattern at all. And then, of course, there's anaplastic thyroid cancer. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to touch on some of the systemic therapies and perhaps our approach to when we start systemic therapies in all these different uh, thyroid cancers. Uh, and hopefully that will set you up nicely for the rest of the meeting over the next few days. So, you know, the background is that early stage thyroid cancer has been, there's been an explosion of early stage thyroid cancer. So we have seen from the 1970s, uh, a, a huge increase of almost, five, of almost threefold in the numbers of cases of differentiated thyroid cancer uh, being diagnosed, primarily papillary thyroid cancer, but not completely. And um, from an oncology perspective, the management of these early stage thyroid cancers does present us with quite unique challenges because the majority um, are very early stage, they're very small, they're treatable and they're curable. So, you know, you see from these statistics, um, almost 50% are under a centimetre when they, when they present, 
um, almost 60% of patients are under 50 uh, years old when they present. And the mortality rate, so the, the chance of patients dying from these, uh, these early um, thyroid cancers is extremely low, you know, just under 2% for papillary and uh, just over 3% uh, if you combine with follicular as well. So in these early stage patients, we have a real responsibility as clinicians in uh, balancing the benefit of treatment. Um, so in, in terms of getting rid of, curing the cancer, but balancing that with any side effects or long-term problems that we might uh, cause with our treatment. And so the real push in early thyroid cancer has been to minimize treatment uh, intensity, so reducing the amount of radioiodine we give, do we need to give radioiodine at all? Um, do we, can we reduce and relax the TSH suppression, uh, which we do with our thyroxine doses? And now more frequently, can we actually reduce the amount of surgery um, uh, that we're doing as well? So that's the sort of background of the overall picture of thyroid cancer. And it's a much smaller percentage of patients, uh, thankfully, that uh, progress on to having more advanced um, and uh, metastatic or uh, spread of their thyroid cancer, which we'll come on to talk about. Matt, have you got a question for me there? We, we do have a question. Um, there were a couple of questions regarding PDTC. And yes. can, you, can you touch on when to start therapy? And are we grouping PDTC with differentiated thyroid cancer? Yes, yeah, so poorly differentiated thyroid cancer, uh, as many of the um, listeners will, will um, uh, know, often starts off as differentiated thyroid cancer. And then as it progresses, will perhaps become less well differentiated. And actually, I'm going to come on to talking about what we mean by differentiation, and maybe that's a good time to do that. Um, and we can just talk about it here with this slide, because it's a it's a word that we throw about a lot as clinicians, and it means quite a lot. And it certainly has implications for treatment. So we are beginning to talk about poorly differentiated thyroid cancer as an entity in itself. Um, and that is great news because that really means that we're focusing on it and understanding now that it is a different entity to just papillary thyroid cancer or just follicular thyroid cancer. Um, and it means that we can move towards looking at specific treatments and trials within that particular group of patients. But what we mean about differentiation is cellular differentiation is the process of a cell changing from one type to another. So when we're all um, in the embryonic stage, our, our cells are differentiating from a, from a pluripotential cell, so a cell that can become anything, into a, a specialised type of cell, so a thyroid follicular cell, for example. D-differentiation is, of course, that process in reverse. Um, and that means that it, you, a cell doesn't look quite the same as it, its, its original um, organ. Um, and it starts to look less and less like that. And that's what we see typically in cancer. As cancer cells reproduce, uh, they mutate and they can become less differentiated. And in thyroid cancer, that means looking less like the original thyroid cell. Uh, and typically, the less differentiated a cell is, the more aggressive it will um, be in terms of a cancer uh, cell. So it will grow more quickly, it will have more um, propensity to, to, to seed elsewhere in the body to metastasize. And differentiation is used in tumor grading systems as well. So in many other cancers, you'll say uh, they'll have different grades, one to three, uh, you know, which reflects that level of differentiation. In thyroid cancer, we don't say use the grading system, but we do talk about uh, degrees of differentiation, as in poorly differentiated or well differentiated or undifferentiated, which is completely the other end of the spectrum, which is anaplastic. So I hope that makes sense. In, in terms of what it means for thyroid cancer, is that a differentiated thyroid cancer cell um, expresses 
TSH receptors, so thyroid stimulating hormone receptors. So uh, differentiated thyroid cancers are, um, are uh, um, responsive to the thyroid stimulating hormone, which is why we suppress thyroid stimulating hormone in the body by giving you slightly higher thyroxine doses than you need just as a replacement. Because if, there's, um, if your thyroxine levels drop, your TSH levels come up, because the pituitary gland is trying to push out more thyroxine uh, into the body, thinking you've still got a thyroid gland there. And that TSH level will also stimulate differentiated thyroid cancer cells because it will, it will stimulate those TSH receptors that are expressed on the surface of the cell. The other thing that we have in differentiated thyroid cancer cells is, are the sodium iodide channels. And these are pumps in the membrane of the cell which actively bring iodine or iodide ions into the cell. So that means that differentiated thyroid cancer cells are sensitive to radioactive iodine because those cells have the ability to bring iodide ions into the cell and therefore useful because we can use radioactive iodine to kill off those cells. But as the thyroid cells cancer cells become less differentiated, they lose those TSH receptors. So they're not so sensitive to the TSH suppression in controlling the cancer. And they often lose those pumps in the membrane and become less able to take in iodine and therefore become iodine refractory. So I hope that explains it a little bit. I can see some more questions coming in, Matt. So um, there we, go. we do have a question regarding a clinical trial by researchers at the ICR regarding a new cancer treatment. And they're looking regarding destroying the head and neck tumors. And they're wondering if this treatment works for patients who are REI resistant, mm -hmm. stage two. So I think that's probably um, the ipilimumab and the uh, uh, nivolumab combination that you might be talking about, and that's immunotherapy. Um, and uh, immunotherapy is being uh, uh, investigated in anaplastic thyroid cancer at the moment. Um, so um, colleagues at MD Anderson, for example, Professor Cabanillas, um, it has been looking at immunotherapy. Um, my colleague, uh, Jome Captavia in Barcelona, has published um, data on spartalizumab, which is a um, immunotherapy, uh, which has shown activity in uh, anaplastic thyroid cancer. And by, when I say activity, I mean it, it has shown shrinkage of the disease in some patients. Um, and also a very small paper was, um, a, a, a paper was published by, by uh, Christine, Christine Dirks in Germany recently with only a small series of patients with pembrolizumab, which is an immunotherapy plus lenvatinib, which showed uh, in, uh, exciting responses um, in anaplastic thyroid cancer. But these um, certainly still quite rightly remain uh, areas of research to work out how much um, uh, effect immunotherapy is going to have in poorly differentiated thyroid cancer. So we can't, certainly in the UK, we can't access that for poorly differentiated thyroid cancer yet. Um, but I would hope that would be something that is going to come through either within a trial or uh, if we get data from trials that are currently undergoing, then hopefully it may become available uh, soon. Certainly for anaplastic thyroid cancer, uh, in the UK, we can't um, access that readily. Um, I certainly try on an individual basis to request it um, for patients, but there's not funding there for it. In the US, I know that it is um, used much more widely uh, already um, within the big centers. Um, so we are gaining information um, uh, um, uh, on the use of immunotherapy. And I think that's what your um, the, um, uh, the question regarding the, the Guardian article uh, from the ICR. So are variants of papillary thyroid cancer such as tall cell D-differentiated? 
So tall cell variants are not necessarily de-differentiated, but we do know that tall cell uh, variants um, behave more aggressively than the non-tall cell, cell variants. Um, yeah, the higher the higher the 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 more um, the de-differentiation, the more likely the tumor is uh, to spread, uh, and the more rapidly it is likely to to grow. Is it possible to have a differentiated yet iodine-resistant papillary thyroid cancer? Uh, it's a really good question because this is all a spectrum. And so what we, we know is that we, we find that we get um, uh, iodine refractory thyroid cancers, and that's defined uh, in, in several uh, different ways. But what we haven't been doing regularly um, is biopsying the tumour again at that point to then have a look at the differentiation under the microscope. And that's the only way we would know that. But biologically, it makes sense that the reason the tumour is becoming iodine resistant is that it is likely to be de-differentiating, so becoming less like that original thyroid cell and therefore less able to take up iodine um, uh, usefully. These are fantastic questions. Um, to maximise TSH suppression, is it better to take synthyroid in the, in the morning or, or PM? Well, we do, I don't use synthyroid, um, so I wouldn't know specifically for synthyroid, but generally um, uh, for levothyroxine um, that we prescribe, as long as it's, it's 24 hours uh, apart, then it shouldn't make a difference whether it's morning or evening. Um, because it's a 24 hour uh, uh, preparation. And the reason we, we like using um, levothyroxine rather than liothyronine is because you get a much more even level of your TSH suppression rather than getting peaks and troughs throughout the day. Um, is there a bleeding risk when taking Lenvima uh, for papillary thyroid cancer metastases in the kidney? Well, um, Lenvatinib or Lenvima uh, has a big action on um, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor receptors. So this is a target for many of the multi-kinase inhibitors like lenvatinib, cabozantinib, vandetinib, and serafinib. And what the anti-VEGF activity does is it, it, it sort of um, tries to break down the blood supply that tumours develop as they grow. And um, the risk with, with anti-VEGF um, activity is high blood pressure, which is why particularly with lenvima or lenvatinib, we see that blood pressure is a side effect, but it also can uh, increase the risk of bleeding and healing. And so one of the things we always check for um, uh, are patients with something, you know, areas that may uh, be at risk of bleeding where they have disease. Um, so brain metastases, for example, we're slightly um, um, cautious about starting these drugs. Perhaps we might give radiotherapy first to reduce the likelihood of bleeding there, because obviously bleeding there in the brain would have um, significant clinical impacts. Certainly, um, renal cell cancers, so kidney cancers themselves are quite vascular, but as a metastasis from thyroid, I would still treat it at the same as metastases elsewhere. And, and we would have to be conscious that any metastasis might bleed when you're on Lenvima, um, but that risk has to be outweighed by the, the risk of, of shrinking the cancer itself. So you just have to be aware of these things. Um, when you're prescribing. Um, uh, so I've answered the fir first two from Carol and from uh, Madhu, and then there's an anonymous one. If no evidence of disease via ultrasound and thyroglobulin 1.5 or less, would it still be optimum for radioiodine if no other lymph node involvement and no metastases, but you still had tall cell and PDT at initial diagnosis, I'm seeing more and more people giving 30 millicuries versus something much higher. So um, uh, there's quite a lot packed into that uh, question, um, but certainly I would still be giving uh, iodine ablation um, 
to patients who had tall cell or poorly differentiated uh, thyroid cancer at diagnosis. And um, with those, I would, I, it depends on some of the other features as to whether I would give 30 millicuries, which in um, the UK we, we, call, we, we quote them in gigabecquerels, which is 1.1 gigabecquerels, versus 100 millicuries, which is uh, 3.7 gigabecquerels. So we still weigh up lots of factors to decide um, the, um, the dose, but if it's poorly differentiated, I'd be giving 3.7 or 100 um, uh, in the majority. The tall cell, um, I tend towards 3.7, but there would be some factors uh, which might make me feel I could um, initially try a lower activity. Why do some people um, not feel normal again? Why do some people not feel normal again in terms of energy levels or mood after thyroid, uh, total thyroidectomy, even when the TSH and T4 levels are normal range? Is there anything you recommend? Sarah, that's such a, a common question. And I'm not an endocrinologist. So um, what I'm an oncologist. So what I tend to, to do is I do advise my patients from experience that it can take months before your body seems to adapt to what we call exogenous um, thyroxine as opposed to endogenous, i.e. thyroxine that you're taking from outside the body rather than making from inside the body. Um, in my patients who really still struggle with how they feel, um, I, um, even after you know maybe six months of being on the dose and the, and the blood levels all looking fine, then I will ask for a specialist endocrine opinion just so that they can have everything looked at. Um, not just focusing on the thyroid function in case there's any any other endocrine um, uh, aspects that are contributing to that. Um, and it's and if patients want to talk about the use of um, T3 in addition to their their um, thyroxine, or whether they want to take um, more of the um, natural um, thyroxine preparations, then again, I send them, I refer them to a, a specialist endocrinologist for that discussion. So I'm, I'm not an expert in, in that as such. Uh, would you suggest radiotherapy when radioiodine no longer works for iodine refractory in a young male patient around 29 years of age? Um, so the, the use of radiotherapy, so external beam radiotherapy, so this is where rather than giving iodine and you're getting an intracellular dose of radiation, so you're getting radiation because you've ingested the radioiodine and it's been taken up and soaked up into the thyroid cancer cells, external beam radiotherapy is where we're giving radiation shining from the outside into the neck uh, with beam and it's, you can use an external beam radiotherapy as the overall umbrella term. And within that, we have more focused radiotherapy using intensity modulated radiotherapy, IMRT. And in, in other parts of the body, we might be using stereotactic radiotherapy, which you might see abbreviated to SBRT or SABR, SABR, um, where we're focusing a very highly focused uh, beam of radiation um, to a small area. So historically, sometimes, um, so sort of more than 20 years ago, we might consider external beam radiotherapy to the whole neck um, to patients after their thyroidectomy if they had quite aggressive looking disease, multiple nodal involvement, and um, it might have been more of a routine part of treatment. We certainly know now that irradiating the whole neck in, in thyroid cancer, where our patients are going to live for many, many years, decades, um, uh, and you know their, their life may not even be shortened by their diagnosis in the majority of cases, that the long-term side effects of having external beam radiotherapy to the neck need to be seriously considered. And so there's been a real move away giving almost routine radiotherapy to the neck after thyroid cancer to using it in very specific circumstances. And, and at the moment, the circumstances in, uh, up front, so if you right at the beginning when you've had your thyroidectomy would be if the surgeon says there's been, he knows there's definite disease, macroscopic disease remaining, i.e. disease that he can see or he or she can see after the operation because it's been invading the trachea, the windpipe or the esophagus, the gullet, 
Um, uh, and what you're really aiming for there is better control of the disease locally, because clearly recurrent disease in that part will be troublesome um, in terms of the voice box and swallowing apparatus. Um, <clears throat> so that's one of the indications where we would consider external beam radiotherapy. In a 29-year-old who's going to have a many, many years ahead of them, we'd be very cautious about that. In, in the US, certainly the guidance is that you wouldn't irradiate under 45. Um, in the UK, we're a, we don't have such a stipulation, but we, I would have to be, I would have to have very strong uh, feeling that I was going to give you some benefit to give you external beam radiotherapy and, and uh, over the, the, the definite long term uh, side effects that, that, that you would you would be at risk of. Um, otherwise, we use radiotherapy in the palliative setting. So in patients who have got uh, metastatic disease, so deposits of the disease outside of the neck, uh, and it's extremely useful for controlling pain, for shrinking down lesions, so particularly in bones, brain metastases, um, and, and, and anywhere else you can consider uh, external beam radiotherapy in that situation. Should we continue with the presentation and then pick up some questions a little bit later? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Yep. So um, I'll just minimize those. So uh, this was just a, an, another background for just uh, explaining um, so what we mean by locally advanced or metastatic disease is really when it's no longer amenable to a radical or, or curative approach. And for, for differentiated thyroid cancers, this will usually be when it's become iodine refractory. And these are the things that we, we use to define iodine refractory so that the disease may not take up radioactive iodine. It may have taken it up, but then stopped taking it up. Or you may have mixed picture. So some of the disease takes up the iodine, but some doesn't. And so it's going to be the disease that doesn't take it up that, that, that determines the natural history um, of the cancer. Um, and so that's, you know, becomes refractory because that's the bit you're going to need to focus on. Um, uh, and interestingly, um, and we do see patients where the iodine still seems to be taken up really well but the thyroglobulin doesn't fall and the disease doesn't shrink. And in those situations, you have to keep saying, well, actually, am I doing this patient any good by exposing them to more radioactivity when actually we don't seem to be impacting on the disease? And then finally, what, is, what I find very helpful is to do FDG PET CT scans at this stage when you're not quite sure whether the iodine is still useful. Because as the thyroid cancer stops taking up iodine, it will start to take up FDG, which is a glucose, is a radioactive glucose analog. So it behaves like glucose. And so as, as cancers are more, more um, uh, fast growing, more aggressive, they need glucose to feed them. And so that's why FDG PET is very useful in oncology and other cancers, because cancer cells will take up much more glucose than normal cells. And that's where FDG PET is helpful. And um, what we see in thyroid cancer is that as the iodine um, avidity, so the ability for the tumors to take up iodine goes down, the FDG goes up. And so if you've got FDG positive disease or disease that's positive on a PET, that's a good indicator that your disease is unlikely to be continuing to respond to radioactive iodine. And so I find that very helpful in my discussions with my patients about when to stop iodine. Always worth checking the iodine refractory status because you don't want to throw out a really useful and effective treatment unless it's definitely you're definitely sure. So quite often I'll have patients referred to me from a, um, a smaller center saying, oh, this patient doesn't seem to be responding to um, iodine, but I always go back and check and make sure that they were adequately prepared for the iodine, um, that they hadn't just had iodine contrast in a CT scan, which would block the radioactive iodine, you know, and et cetera, so that we don't, don't dismiss iodine, which is very, very effective before it, um, before it really is um, uh, no longer useful. Uh, for medullary thyroid cancer, again, um, advanced metastatic disease when it's not amenable to complete surgical resection. And unfortunately, in anaplastic thyroid cancer, most cases present with uh, advanced disease. So um, similar to the early stage disease, 
in uh, advanced thyroid cancers, different to other cancers, we still are looking at patients living with their disease for many years and even decades. And so again, as an oncologist, you have to sort of step slightly out of the, the normal oncological frame of mind and say, well, again, I need to really, really balance the starting a treatment in this patient versus the potential side effects that they will experience over many, many years. Many of my patients, even with advanced disease, will still be working full time, looking after young children, you know, following a normal life. And uh, therefore, any of my interventions with drug treatments particularly can impair that quality of life. And it needs to be therefore very carefully thought out when you start, because the, these, the drug treatments are not going to get rid of the disease. They're going to control it. And therefore, you need to balance when to initiate the treatments. And that really does emphasize the need for an individualized management plan discussed within a multidisciplinary setting with surgeons, with radiotherapy uh, uh, oncologists, with um, specialist nurses, nuclear medics, everyone in together. So treatments generally upfront, we know surgery is, is the only curative option for thyroid cancer. So the best surgery upfront is critical with a, a very good high volume thyroid surgeon. I mean, that, that is the biggest step up, up front. And you don't want a general surgeon who dabbles in thyroid once a year to be fumbling around in the neck. You want someone who does this all the time, day in, day out, day out um, to do the surgery. Then we can use radioactive iodine, as I've explained, in differentiated thyroid cancers. We can use TSH suppression by manipulating the thyroxine doses external beam, the role for it I've explained. And then in the more advanced cases, then we come on to drug therapies. And so we talk about small molecule kinase inhibitors, and these are, I used to call them targeted therapies, but now we have more targeted therapies, which are targeted specifically at a gene abnormality. And I'll talk about that later. So the small molecule kinase inhibitors have multiple targets, and these include drugs lenvatinib, serafinib, cabozantinib, vandetinib. I'll briefly touch on redifferentiation. So that's the other um, aspect of as, as your tumor loses its ability to take up iodine, can we reverse that? Can we make use of the iodine still by manipulating the tumor back a few levels of differentiation? And uh, there's some exciting um, developments in that field. Then we'll talk about the targeted therapies, which are targeted against specific genetic um, abnormalities, such as um, the RET uh, mutation for medullary thyroid cancers, um, BRAF mutation in anaplastic thyroid cancers, and also fusions of genes, um, which are abnormal, which can be RET PTC fusion, NTRAC fusion, ALK fusion. Um, and I've forgotten one, I've left one out, um, NTRAC, ALK, RET, that fits in, I think, in, in cancers, which we are now beginning to look at because we have drugs um, against them. And then there are the immunotherapies, which I've also uh, already touched on through the questions. Before we get on to those drug treatments, don't forget the simple things, you know, for medullary patients particularly, um, anti-diarrheal medicine can make a huge difference and can hold off um, needing to start uh, actual anti-cancer therapies uh, for a while. Uh, engagement. So in the UK, we engage our palliative care team probably quite early during, um, during uh, the disease. Not, this is not just end of life um, involvement, much earlier because they have great expertise in managing symptoms helping with the psychological side of things uh, and managing and, and supporting the family. So we really find that incredibly helpful. And that together with um, specific psychological support, social support and a specialist nurse is key. I, I, I can't um, emphasize more the importance of having specialist nurses as, as your key um, contact uh, together with the medical team. I think they provide an invaluable service, which many of you will have benefited from, I'm sure. Matt, just interrupt me if you think I need to answer anything on, on the way. We'll pick them up as we get closer to the end. 
Okay. So localized management of, of advanced thyroid cancer is also important. So yes, we go on to drug treatment, but if patients looking at every time I see my patient, I look at the disease everywhere and I think, okay, generally they're really well. I don't want them to start having drug related side effects yet, but this lesion in the lung is growing and the others, nothing else seems to be growing much. So can I treat just that with what we call localized ablative treatments? And that might be targeted radiotherapy. It might be surgery. Um, if there's something pressing on a, on a blood vessel, then you can stent the vessel by putting in something which holds the vessel open against the tumor. Um, vertebroplasty is really effective for um, deposits of cancer in the spinal bones, and our spinal surgeons can, in, and can inject with cement to keep the structure of, of the, the spine, so that helps with pain. Radiofrequency ablation for lung metastases, liver metastases, embolization where you starve, you block the blood supply off um, to a metastasis typically in the liver with medullary thyroid cancer can really help symptoms before you need to start on drug treatments or in addition to drug treatments. So if you're established on a drug treatment but one lesion seems to be growing, again, I might utilize one of these modalities to, to just hold things for a little bit longer. And again, it just em emphasizes the importance of being in a unit where you've got all the different disciplines to talk about you don't want to just be under one you know a, a one physician who you know is, is acting on their own you want them to be within this specialized unit so you have access to all these potential treatments so getting on to the systemic so when i talk about systemic this is something that affects the whole body because it's usually either ingested or injected so it goes into the bloodstream um, and uh, affects the disease throughout the body. So, of course, radioiodine is a systemic therapy, but we're going to talk more about the kinase inhibitors, um, which I've mentioned. There have been um, trials with vascular disrupting agents such as convretostatin, particularly in anaplastic, but that hasn't really come into clinical practice. mTOR inhibitors such as Everolimus, again, some case reports in, in, um, in poorly differentiated and anaplastic that there may be some activity or combinations of, uh, of, the, of the drugs. And then we've got these more targeted therapies, which we've now had access to really in the last couple of years only. So in, in, in medullary um, cancers that have a RET mutation, selpicatinib and pralcetinib have, have really, uh, are really exciting and have shown fantastic uh, response rates with shrinkage of dramatic shrinkage of disease and fewer side effects than perhaps the, the, mul the multi-kinase inhibitors above. Those can also be used in differentiated thyroid cancers that have a RET fusion. So um, <clears throat> in all my patients that start, become uh, advanced, become iodine refractory, I will now profile their um, their DNA, the molecular buildup of their tumour, I'll send it off for all these targets so that we know that we've got the potential to use these. BRAF inhibitors, um, this has revolutionised um, the treatment of some patients in ana with anaplastic thyroid cancer, sadly not all, but in up to 45%, you might have a BRAF mutation in the tumour um, using the combination of dabrafenib and a MEK inhibitor, trametinib. We've seen really um, dramatic responses in a tumour where, as you will know, sadly, there's been very few effective treatments. Um, Redifferentiation, I will talk about. I can't remember which side. Um, and maybe I'll skip over my case because actually I'm looking at the time and because lots of questions are coming through, I think we're almost talking about that anyway. So we talk a lot about when to start these drug treatments and we and as clinicians we talk a lot about resist criteria and I thought it certainly my patients will say well, I don't understand what you mean by this and this is a way of scoring your scans objectively so we may think that your disease is progressing by your biochemical markers your thyroid globulin your calcitonin your CEA um, but we always look at the scans because they give us a much more objective uh, measurement of where the disease is. And this is a scoring system that means that you can compare between different patients in trials. 
And so in the trials, it's always used. And we, we classify it as complete response or CR, and that means all the lesions have disappeared within the scan. Partial response has to be um, more than or equal to 30% decrease in the sum of the longest diameters of all the, of all the lesions, and obviously no new lesions and no progression of non-target lesions. So when you first start a treatment, you look at the scan, you identify some target lesions that you're going to measure as a measure of response. But I just wanted to point out that a partial response does mean it has to, it's not just a little bit of shrinkage, it has to have shrunk by 30% or more. Stable disease is obviously no response and no progression. Progressive disease is um, if the, the, the diameter of the lesions has, has increased more than 20% and or there are new, um, new lesions that have uh, arisen. And um, that is, is used in trials as a stopping. Uh, so that you will come off the trial drug if you have progressive disease by resist. So I thought it would be useful just to sort of um, define that. So in patients who are iodine refractory, the first study that came out um, in the Lancet back in 2014 now was published by Marsha Rose, um, then at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and she uh, provided us with the first data of any drug that had any activity in this situation. And that was serafinib. And that showed that um, if you gave patients who's just, who had um, iodine refractory thyroid cancer, serafinib uh, uh, or placebo, then the patients on placebo took 5.8 months before their disease progressed, whereas those on serafinib doubled that, it took 10.8 months before their disease progressed. Um, and that was the first time we'd ever seen a drug which, which was able to slow down the progression of the cancer in this point. So that was a, a breakthrough and, and the first of, of the um, uh, kinase inhibitors to come through. But just to point out, we weren't really seeing any shrinkage of disease. It was mainly stable disease that this drug was doing. So it was stopping the growth, but it wasn't really reducing the volume of it. And it did come with um, uh, significant side effects that required dose interruption in over two thirds of patients. Uh, and a dose reduction in 64%. So it didn't come without its side effects. The second drug to be looked at was lenvafenib in the SELECT trial. And this was published by Martin Schlumberger um, in uh, 2015. And this, this was very similar drug to serafinib, but perhaps more potent on the um, VEGF uh, particularly, which we mentioned um, pathway. And this showed a more dramatic um, uh, difference. You can't compare the two drugs head to head, but this did show um, that in patients who were on placebo, they took 3.6 months to progress. So probably a slightly more advanced population than the, the serafinib study. But in those that were on lenvatinib, it took 18.3 months. So we had here a 15 month advantage in patients who are on lenvatinib. And the difference with lenvatinib and serafinib is that you got partial responses. So in over 60%, there was an actual shrinkage of disease as well, which as a clinician prescribing, that's very useful because for my patients who are getting problems because of the size of the tumor, pressure, pain, squashing something that shouldn't be squashing, then being able to shrink the disease as well as stopping it growing is, is an advantage. Um, and so both of those trials, um, you know, over five years ago now, um, really set the scene for starting us with some drug treatment options after patients become resistant to iodine. But the typical side effects that we see, what we see with these are blood pressure, diarrhea, loss of appetite, generalized fatigue. Um, and so they don't come, the, the effects don't come for free, basically. So there have been lots of um, publications on how to manage these side effects in order to keep your patients on the drug to get the maximum anti-cancer effect. And these guidelines are pretty good now. We've all uh, got many years under our belts of managing patients on these. So I think that we probably see a much lower um, level of side effect, lower severity of side effect, and we can tackle them much better than perhaps we first did in those, those trials. Uh, so we have many patients who are on these drugs now, managing life without too many uh, side effects.
Um, what I would just pop is pop up is this um, this this subsequent subgroup analysis of the patients from the select trial, which does show that there is an impact of interrupting the lenvapenib for a period of time. So the blue line is those patients who's, who didn't have any drug interruptions um, for less than 10% of the, the time they were on it, versus in purple, those who had more inter time off the drug because of toxicities versus those on placebo. So this is a tr this is this along the y axis uh, the x axis is the time in months and the um, y axis is survival. So what you see is the patients who do best are those who have very little interruption in their dosing of lenvapenib because the 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 graph the line is is highest up the survival survivability um, axis um, as we go along in time. The People who do have to have interruptions don't do as well in terms of, of progression-free survival, i.e. the drug, the disease may start to grow more quickly than those who haven't had interruptions, but they still do better than placebo. But it's just something to bear in mind when we're, we want to get you back onto the drug. This is the kind of data that we're thinking about uh, in the background. So I touched on molecular profiling. This is something we've moved forward. Thankfully, in England, so UK, we have different health funding for Scotland, uh, England, Wales, um, so and, and Northern Ireland, so it is a bit complicated, but certainly now we have funding to do molecular um, profiling in our thyroid cancer patients. I will um, do uh, will send the tissue off for profiling all my patients who become iodine refractory in all my medullary patients uh, and all my anaplastic patients as well. So I will be looking at all those um, genomic changes, so um, uh, mutations in, in RET or BRAF, um, fusions in ALK and NTRAC and RET PTC, because I know that there are drugs there that can be useful in those situations. We do have about 10 minutes left. Yeah. So um, redifferentiation story, um, really, this is where um, we're trying to educate the cancer to take up iodine again. And Alan Ho published this in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2013. It was exciting. And uh, what he did was he looked at the iodine uptake before giving the patient a MEK inhibitor a small molecule um, drug, then he did a PET again. After that, this is an iodine PET, specific iodine PET. And if there'd been uptake after that four week period on the drug, then the patient would go on to have iodine. And for the first time, we were actually seeing a clinical response. So not just, oh yeah, there's a bit more iodine uptake, but actually it was shrinking disease. Um, and what you can see is this patient at baseline, no uptake of iodine in the lungs, and then after the selumetinib, uh, these black dots are uh, iodine uh, uptake within the lung metastases. Similar in this bone metastasis in the pelvis, much more uptake after selumetinib. And this actually correlated with a shrinkage of disease. Now, this was just an early study in just a few patients. But that's been taken on, and that is still an area of research. We tried this, to replicate the study in the UK, and sadly, we didn't get as much conversion as we expected to from the whole paper in terms of those that, that had increased iodine uptake. And so we had to stop that, that uh, trial early because we wouldn't have had funding to take the, the number of patients that we would have needed to identify a difference. So it's not that it's not working, it's just that it's not, it, it probably needs to be focused much more on a specific subset of, of patients who maybe are just on the turn of becoming refractory rather than have had disease that's been refractory for many years. And this remains an area of, um, of research. Briefly, I'm just going to briefly tell you about the different studies in medullary uh, with the drugs, but you will have more information on this with talks later in the weekend. So the first study that to show an improvement or a slowing down of um, uh, medullary thyroid cancer was, was Rosella Elise from Pisa. Her study with cabazantinib, which showed that the patients um, on cabazantinib, um, their disease took 11 months to progress rather than four months for those on placebo. Very similar design to the serafinib one and the lenvapenib one, but just again showed us that there we had a drug here that would slow progression down. Similarly, Sam Wells, 
um, published the year before with vandetinib, a difference between patients on vandetinib versus placebo in terms of how long it took for the disease to progress. These, both of these drugs had very similar side effects to lenvatinib and serafinib with high blood pressure, diarrhea, general symptoms of fatigue and going off your food. Um, so very similar. And then these are the more recent studies with the specific RET uh, inhibitors. So selpicatinib, um, and this shows a, a waterfall plot for patients who previously had bandetinib or cabazantinib or, pre or haven't had any treatment. And anything below this zero line is a shrinkage of disease. And this is the percentage. So this is the re resist, sorry. Um, so anything below is showing a shrinkage. And so each bar relates to, a, relates to a patient and each of those patients has had a shrinkage of disease. And similarly, in, so this is in either patients who've had previous treatment or who haven't. And so that has been exciting. And the good news is that the majority of side effects with selpicatinib are in grade one or grade two, i.e. mild, um, compared to those that we would see in cabazantinib or vandetinib. And similarly, pralcetinib, also a RET inhibitor, a similar waterfall plot that you can see here. These are patients who previously had vandetinib or cabazantinib. These are patients who haven't. So again, very effective in shrinking the disease down. And but they, they have seemed to be better tolerated in terms of side effects than uh, the cabazantinib or vandetinib. So a bit of progress uh, or significant progress for our medullary patients. And I'll just touch on anaplastic because I want to leave some time for the questions. But we talked about um, uh, up to 45% of patients with anaplastic thyroid cancers may have a BRAF mutation. It is really important that your doctor, if you're diagnosed with anaplastic, checks for that urgently. Because if it's there, we now see that if you use a combination of drugs, dobrafenib and trametinib, you can get response rates of almost 70%, i.e. shrinkage of disease in that number of patients. And the um, this is again, this waterfall plot, you can see the shrinkage of disease in these patients. And that it also has a duration of response. So here, We've got a patient with partial response that's, you know, up to still without any progression of disease at 120 weeks after. And in anaplastic, that's been a major um, push through. So we must look for these mutations in our anaplastic thyroid cancers. This was one of my patients. Um, you can see how she had this ulcerating tumour um, coming out through the skin. We gave her some dobrafenib and trametinib and it shrunk back into the neck there. So this big area of disease here, you can see is shrinking back and then it's not really visible um, after 10 weeks. So it really can give quite dramatic, um, uh, pitch, uh, uh, dramatic results. And this is now approved in, in uh, the US and in, the, in England, um, well, actually in the UK, we can give that for patients with the mutation through a, an expanded access program where we apply it on an individual basis. So I want to stop talking there, so I've got some time to answer some of the questions. One question we have is, um, they don't have any specific gene mutations, but their tumor mutation burden is high. What does that imply? Um, so the tumor mutational burden or the TMB is um, something that we look for to see whether in other cancers, whether immunotherapy is going to be helpful. And so that is certainly we're looking at that in, in thyroid cancers because it indicates that there might be an immunogenicity of the tumor. So um, that the tumor might be expressing quite a lot of immune um, uh, proteins that can be targeted by immunotherapy. So that would be would lead into a discussion of maybe going into a trial of immunotherapy, or if you've got immunotherapy available, then it might be something to suggest you should go along that line. Uh, what effect does NRAS mutation have on poorly differentiated thyroid cancer prognosis? M-A-R-S. Oh, oh, MRAS. Oh, MRAS. Yeah. Um, so we, we see quite a lot of the RAS mutations in um, uh, follicular um, carcinomas. There's not, there are some drugs which target this, but we don't 
really have any good evidence for specific RAS directed drugs um, uh, in thyroid cancer at the moment. So we'd still go along, first of all, lenvatinib uh, in the first instance with, with that mutation. Um, is there a genetic test that one can do to check for RA, RAI refractory, refractory? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, we know that some subtypes, so just looking at the histological, so um, a hurtle cell obviously is less likely to take up iodine um, than straightforward papillary or straightforward follicular. Um, we know that the combination of a BRAF mutation and a TERT promoter mutation may well um, um, suggest that uh, uh, iodine is going to be less effective. So. We don't have we don't have something that says definitely will be iodine refractory, but we have indicators that um, would make us suspicious that it may not be the the uh, as effective treatment. How long was the Lenvima break for patients who couldn't take it continuously? Months, weeks? Sorry, say that again. How long was the Lenvima break for patients who couldn't take it continuously? Um, it varied, um, and they and they they classified it on that uh, subgroup analysis as a percentage of the total time that they'd been on it. Um, so uh, it, it it was between weeks and months. So it's a significant time, rather than you know coming off it for uh, a week or two to let a, a specific side effect um, subside. So um, you know in some situations you have to have a break because otherwise you won't be on it at all. Um, so it is just to say that sometimes when you've been on it for a long time, you start to think, oh, actually, you know, I can take, you know, maybe, maybe I could take a couple of months holiday from this drug. But it, it suggests that actually, um, you know, we want to keep those interruptions to a minimum, not that you can't take three weeks off because you want to have a good time at a family wedding and holiday or whatever. I think those are, you know, it just has to be balanced. But it's interesting that we do have some data whereas before we didn't, that, that probably these interruptions do have an impact if they're, if they're prolonged. So we got one last question. Uh, can you comment on TERT and PIC 13 ca genetic changes to poorly differentiated patients? Yeah, so um, nice questions. Um, these, so <clears throat> both TERT and PIK3, um, uh, the mutations are, um, they, we know that TERT promoter with anything, um, so usually coincides with another mutation such as BRAF or the PI3 kinase, does tend to predict for more aggressive um, behavior. And this is an area with the poorly differentiated that we are um, specifically focusing in on now in, the, in terms of research. And ITOG, the International um, Thyroid Oncology Group, um, which um, mainly with US uh, colleagues, but is worldwide now, which we're, um, I'm part of, thank, um, which is great, uh, has a subgroup specifically looking at this now. So I'm hoping um, that for patients with, with um, poorly differentiated with these mutations, we'll be having uh, more information and, and hopefully more targeted therapies coming through. And unfortunately, that's our time for this session. And I want to wow. thank you for uh, presenting for everybody. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. I really do hope um, that I've managed to answer some questions. It was a race, but you have got so much, um, so many good talks coming up that you will be able to fill in the gaps, I'm sure. For sure. And uh, thank you for everybody attending and we will see you at the next session. Thanks very much. Thank you.